Well, Professor Mir uh, Schremer uh, gave a very eloquent uh, presentation. And before I came, and some people questioned me, and uh, what you can debate between two realists. <laughs> you, are, <laughs> you are almost the same. You don't have difference. How can you debate up against each other? Well, I have to uh, admit it that for realists, and we do share a lot of things, and especially we share the assumptions. Like the five assumptions are suggested that, uh, by Professor uh, Hammer, every state has to protect his, himself in an anarchical system. All states and uh, only the military capability is a miracle, and you can never trust others' motivation. And uh, all states rank the survival as the most important goal. All states want to maximize their security. The, that, that's why the security dilemma and cannot be avoided between the competition between China and the U.S. And uh, all theories have to base the facts in the history rather than based on the facts of the future because we don't know, right? So I think we have no difference on these assumptions. That's why we can share, or we can have a really serious and a meaningful discussion because we never debate about assumptions. We just debate about the logic and the result or the conclusion, right? Okay, I also agree with the, the some arguments made by uh, Professor uh, Mitch Hammer. And uh, it, I think China, both China and the US want to be the uh, leading power in the world. And China wants to resume its national rejuvenation. And that means uh, China wants to be the number one in the world. And uh, Obama has to say, uh, already tell the Congress, and the US never accept being the uh, second in the world. And uh, from my understanding, it means they never accept any guy uh, equal with the US, not only uh, uh, being the second, even they don't want to have the two number ones. And, uh, and also the sequence. Certainly, all the great powers have to be the regional uh, le uh, leading power before they become the leading power of the world. So th that's inevitable. This is a sequence. It's not a theory. That's a, a, a law of the uh, nature. And then the, the last appointment is that there's a several, there's a several strategy for both China and the US to, maintain, uh, to increase or maintain uh, uh, their uh, uh, positions. And the US have the uh, strategy containment and uh, containment engagement and uh, uh, containment engagement rollback and the uh, offer balance. So certainly there's a several uh, uh, strategy. So the same for China. And we can keep in low profile and we become more uh, uh, responsible for the world, and we can uh, uh, go to war. And so there are also several uh, strategies for China to uh, establish its uh, uh, leading position. Well, except these uh, common things we share with each other, and we certainly have the, some differences. So we'll emphasize the differences between us. And first, for, we have a different view about the strategy selections for being a great power. And uh, just now, Mr. Hammer has to tell you that how the US become a superpower and the only superpower and through all this uh, major violent uh, operation. Well, so that implies that it's inevitable. China, you have no other choice. You have to follow American suit. I don't think you can make, you can find something different from this. Actually, I have a different view from this. And since the Americans have a more alternative strategies to contain China and prevent China from being the uh, number one, and then certainly we have a different, uh, we, we have, there's a more strategies available for China to become the uh, 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 leading power. And uh, for instance, and during the uh, American, and during the competition between the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, and the US mainly rely on the containment strategy which is very different from the strategy adopted by the UK during the colonial period. And when the uh, UK compete against the France, they compete to see who have more uh, uh, colonies. But for the US, they say, no, 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 I don't need to occupy these colonies. I just want to make more allies. So finally, America make more allies, have a powerful alliance, and then uh, uh, win, uh, win the game. So the same for China. Now we move to the new age from my, my understanding. We certainly can look for some, uh, some new strategy. And I think later on I will write on that and what Xi Jinping has already uh, suggested for us. Uh, definitely different from keeping low profile. 
And uh, the um, so um, I would su suggest that the strategy and suggest the strategies uh, uh, illustrated by uh, uh, Xi Jinping on the 24th, reported on the 26th of the People's Daily. I just suggested to Professor Mr. Cameron to uh, get the English version. And uh, he's talking about what we should do. Actually, the new strategy has the goal of, uh, is to create a favorable environment for national rejuvenation. It's a very different from the, uh, 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 the early goal to create a peaceful environment for economic construction. And the tenet of the strategy is to make the neighbors more friendly to China, more friendly to China's uh, 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 the goal of uh, efforts to uh, rejuvenize, uh, rejuvenize uh, the nation. And uh, rather than, this is also different from the uh, previous uh, strategy to uh, give the first priority to the United States. The giving the first priority to the better relationship with the United States means, and if the U.S. have a conflict with our neighbors, we definitely take an abstain, nature. We won't stand at the side against the U.S., and if possible, we will stand at the American side. That means that you can never have a good neighborhood, because Americans do not have a good friendship with all of our neighbors. Right? And, the third, the general layout is to establish three sub-regional economic community and the deep and security cooperation with neighbors. This is very different from before. And now we try to establish uh, the, uh, the Silk Road in the Middle East and uh, uh, over uh, uh, the, the sea, uh, sea silk, uh, silk Road on the southeast of China and also uh, build the, what, this uh, economic corridor with the Indian, Myanmar, and the Bangladesh. And uh, he said that, uh, Hu Jin, uh, uh, Xi Jinping suggested that we should, Xi Jinping suggested that we should deepen our security cooperation with uh, our neighbors. And uh, yearly, and we only, con we only concern the economic security with neighbors, but uh, we're very reluctant uh, talking about security uh, cooperation with them. And uh, the working approach is so many. And uh, the working approach, first, to see, uh, uh, Searching for shared interests rather than looking for the mutual trust. Well, I think you know that there's a debate between me and some others advocating for the mutual trust between China and the U.S. And for me, I think that we, can, we do not need mutual trust between China and the U.S. because we never trust each other, like the Mr. Hammer said. <laughs> we do, I, I fully agree with that. I don't think we can trust each other, but we have a shared interest and we have a complementary interest, and we even have a conflicting interest. All these interests are based for the cooperation. And the common interest and the com complementary interest will help us to build up the positive cooperation, and then based on the conflicting interests, we can develop preventative cooperation. And, uh, and also this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, working approach also concerned that sticking to the value of the justice and the benefits and to, that means uh, the cherish of friendship and the uh, uh, rightness. This is so different from before. Usually we do not want to make the distinction between friends and enemy. Uh, Some will argue that because we moved to the age of the globalization, we no longer need to make the distinction of friends and enemy. So once I make joke that if you are, fr you are equally friend to every woman, then you have no wife. Right? <laughs> so now the same thing for China we're concerned, we have to. And here talking about we have to value the friendship. That means also we do not value those are very confronting against China. So we make the distinction between friends and enemies. And so, and the, 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 the last, uh, not, the last, not the last, the other working approach is that try to make our neighbors economically benefit from China make them benefit economically from China. It's not we try to make both sides mutually benefit each other equally uh, economically. Not economically mutually uh, uh, benefit to each other. We are willing to, okay, give them more favorable uh, 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 treatment. So I, from my understanding, it's very possible you can make friends. If you make your friends benefit from your money and your security protection, that's it. Sir. And certainly, from my understanding, this strategy will concern the term is the fate community, the Mingyun Gongkongi. The fate community, from my understanding, it doesn't mean refer to the free trade zone. It's not the common market. No, it refers to, for me, 
It's an even more deeper relationship than matter allies. It's a combination of the integration of an economy uh, 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 and uh, security. So this is something very new. And from my understanding, this in some way is like the term, I argue, uh, human, uh, human authority. Human authority concerned that to let the others to benefit from his leadership, rather than let others to suffer from his, his leadership. Why? They are not so uh, 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 stupid. They are not uh, giving the money away for, for nothing. They want to get political support. And they need political support. If China wants to re, uh, achieve the national rejuvenation, we have to. We have to pay for it. And you don't have free lunch. OK, the, final, the, 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 the other different view between me, uh, the uh, moral realism and the offensiveness is about the, 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 uh, the, the, the importance of the, uh, uh, the morality. And uh, from my standing, for re- uh, uh, offensive, offense, uh, offensive realism concerns the value of morality, it doesn't mean anything. But for moral realism, we concern is really important. The reason because the this uh, uh, okay, I lost that page, and uh, I have to see uh, from my memory. And uh, from my understanding, for moral realism, we regard it morality is the resources of the capability. And uh, because the morality can help you to strengthen your friendship with neighbors and can strengthen, uh, improve your mo- uh, mo- uh, uh, the capability of mo- mobilizing and the international support and that strengthen your domestic uh, uh, political will. And also because the different morality and the will have the impact of the selection of the strategy. That means, uh, and you find that, and. Uh, Junior Bush will adopt a different strategy from Clinton. And then you find that Deng, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping adopted a different strategy from Mao Zedong. And now I think Xi Jinping is to adopt a different policy from Hu Jintao. And so the different the value really have impact on the morality. For offensive, offensive uh, realism concerned that the military is the base of the capability or the national comprehensive power. For me, I think the political leadership or the from morality uh, moral realism regarding the political leadership is the base. And uh, certainly for economic realism, we regard the economy as the base for the uh, national comprehensive power. Why is it so important? The important thing is that if the leadership is, a, the leadership, the different leadership will adopt a different strategy. For instance, when China was uh, so weak in 1950s and 1960s, we went to a lot of wars. That's the most of preference. And in some way, like the Junior Bush, and their preference and is, uh, is to, uh, for the military solution. But then come to Hu Jintao and uh, Clinton, you find that they are reluctant to go to war. And they have different value. And they have different belief. And that's why And when China was weak, we went to more wars. And when we got getting strong after uh, 1984, we're getting stronger and stronger. We become less and less involved in any war. That's strange. And China is now is the most peaceful country among all of the major powers. And uh, Japan, in, including Japan, all major powers are involved in the war after 1991, but not China. China involved in no war, and that's really strange. I don't think it's normal. Well, finally, I will come to this point with the, what we debated, whether China can uh, 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 rise peacefully well, as a realist, I, don't, I, I, I will argue that I do not rule out the possibility for China being dragged into war. And no one can guarantee that. And so <coughs> that's why uh, Xi Jinping said that we, have, we need to have the bottom line uh, 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 preparation. And so here is that, but I do not uh, so uh, uh, pessimistic uh, like the, uh, Professor Mr. Hammer and uh, uh, concerning the danger of the war between China and the US. I think it's very unlikely. There's two reasons. First is nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons that can prevent the US and the Soviet Union to fight against each other directly. They only carry out the uh, proxy war. And so that means that it's, a very, it's a very possible for China and the US to not fight against each other because the escalation of war to nuclear weapons means to destroy the human being. It means to go to the war. The second is the globalization. 
I know people for a long time we uh, uh, we argue that integration uh, from the uh, Chinese walls and we argue that economic integration cannot prevent the Germany and the France fall into war. Well, they didn't realize that globalization is different from the inter economic interdependence. Economic, economic interdependence only means uh, the increased sensibility as, uh, as well as the uh, uh, vulnerability of the uh, two sides. But the globalization different. Globalization on the one hand increases the sensitivity of the interdependence, make both sides a cautious concern what they, uh, uh, whether they should go to the uh, war against each other. And also, they reduce the vulnerability of the interdependence. What mean reduce the vulner vulnerability of the inter interdependence means that there's an alternative market. You, for instance, when we have a problem with Japan, the South said, hey, we should have a, have a sanction on Japan and make Japan uh, uh, lose their economic benefits. Then what? Japan said, okay, fine. They shift their capital to the uh, uh, Indian, to the, um, what are the, the, the uh, uh, so, uh, Southeast Asia. Well, they can survive. They, 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 can, they are not so vulnerable. They do not need to use the metro fall to protect their market. So from my understanding, the, this uh, theory can also apply to the relationship between China and the US. Even we have the, any sanctions on each other, and I think each side becomes so curious, OK, fine, I find some market or the resources from others. So from my understanding, it's a very hard to believe China and the US will fight against each other directly. How about the, the war between China and the other neighbors? That depends on how do you define the term peaceful rise. For me, peaceful rights means that China do not initiate a war. And I don't mean that when others attack China, we say, OK, fine, because we, this is our principle, peaceful rights, so we will tolerate no matter how you beat me. We also we certainly fight back. So I, do not, I never regarded the fighting back as a, a, a not peaceful, I think, because we are forced to do that. And the final thing is the difference between uh, the moral realism and the uh, and the uh, offensive, uh, offensive realism is the time, time span or time limit for forecast or prediction. My book, The Ancient Thought, Modern Chinese, Ancient Chinese Thought, Modern Chinese Power, and the concern that the leadership is important. So my forecast have to base on the leadership. So my, very, uh, my latest book, The Inertia of the History, China and the World in the Next uh, 10 Years, and I predict that in the next 10 years, it's hardly to believe China will initiate a, a war. I think China uh, did not have that, especially after reading the Xi Jinping's speech on the 24th, and it strengthened my, uh, 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 my confidence in my, uh, in my forecast about the, uh, the uh, next 10 years. I guess that China will become the superpower by the 2023, maybe a little bit earlier than Mr. Hammer predicted. Mr. Hammer's uh, argument considered about 20 or 30 years. And my theory will be tested by the history within 10 years. So I have a more dangerous <laughs> situation to face with. And my theory will possibly be disproved by history. And so Mr. Hammer's theory is the most safe. He can wait for 30 years. OK, thank you. Thank you very much.